Dear friends, we're here in Luke chapter 3. We're walking through verses 7 through 17. Let's go ahead and read. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd said to them, What shall we do? And he said to them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not exhort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. We have this great moment in time that we began to unpack just last week where we have John the Baptist who as a prophet has basically stepped off of the Old Testament passages and is now standing firmly upon the New Testament and it is here that he is heralding in the coming Messiah and he is a preacher who preaches very strongly he preaches very directly. He's, he's not one who is mincing words here. He's not trying to tickle the ears of men. He is speaking directly to these men, directly to these women, to give to them that which is most necessary for them. And here in this passage, he is emphasizing the doctrine of repentance, the, necess the necessity of repentance the requirement of all people who would come to Christ, that they see their sin, that they see the seriousness of their sin, that they see not what they have done, the laws of God that they have violated as, as mere mistakes or, or, or mere errors that they have done, but rather they are a people who have violated the very words of God. They are a people who are made in the image of God and are called to rightly bear His image. They are people who breathe the air that God gives to them. They eat the food that God gives to them. God has blessed them with life. And they have used even the blessings that God has given to them for the purpose of sinning against Him even more and more. Sinning against Him in even greater ways. See, the problem with the people in this passage is not one of mere economics. This cannot be solved by just giving them more money. Merely getting more money would allow them to delve into their sins, to, to search after the lust of the flesh in even greater ways. The problem of the people in this passage is not one merely of education. It's not as though they just need to learn a little bit more. For merely getting more education would merely give them more and more opportunity to sin in more sophisticated ways. But the people in this passage need to see their sin. They need to see the seriousness of their sin. They need to understand that the greatness of their sin, that they can see their need of Jesus. That is John's role here. He is the herald of the Messiah. He is preparing the way of the Lord that the people would rightly receive the Messiah, and he is working here in the area of repentance. He is speaking to this people very directly, very harshly at times. To work within them that they would see their need of Christ. There's three points I want to pull out of this passage. 
We're on the topic of repentance. We see the necessity of repentance here in the first part, that the people must see the need of repentance, the reality of repentance, that apart from repentance, there is no need of the Messiah. You have no need of Christ Jesus if there's nothing you need to turn from. If you're good as you are, and the Messiah is just coming down to make things better for you politically, if he's just coming down to make things better for you economically, you really don't need Jesus. Jesus is not the Messiah that you need. Secondly, we see the fruit of repentance. The Lord who works repentance in someone that brings them to have a change of mindset, brings them to see the seriousness of their sin, their desire to turn from sin and turn to Christ. He works with them a desire to then walk in obedience, and you begin to see the fruits of repentance. And thirdly, I would say this is important. This is a very important aspect where John ends this passage. We see the source of repentance. See, the source of repentance does not find itself either in this people or in John. John even admits this. John can but put the people in water, but it is the Lord who must open the eyes of the people. It is the Lord that must baptize the people in the Holy Spirit. It is the Lord that must bring upon the people the sanctifying fire that he will send upon them, the change that he will do from within them. It will be like a refiner's fire. It will be like the purification of silver or gold and the removing of the dross. Start with that first point, the necessity of repentance. The necessity of repentance. Let's start there in verse 7 of Luke 3. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What an incredible introduction to a sermon. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He calls them a bunch of snakes. You know, when I was in college, I was given a reading assignment in a communication class, and that it was written by Dale Carnegie, and the book's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I can tell you this after reading that book, that Carnegie would not have recommended that John the Baptist begin his sermon in this way. I mean, it's an attention getter. He has everyone's attention when he begins to call them a bunch of snakes, when he calls them a brood of vipers. That's not the kind of attention that Carnegie would have recommended that he give. Understand this, though. That wasn't John the Baptist's goal. John the Baptist is one that, as we have already seen, has cut himself off from the culture in many ways. He is out in the wilderness He is not trying to climb the political ladder. He's not trying to climb the religious ladder. He's not trying to climb the economic ladder. His desire is to preach the word of God. J.C. Ryle makes this point about John the Baptist. He says, his head was not turned by popularity. He cared not who was offended by his words. The spiritual disease of those before him was desperate and was long-standing, and he knew that desperate diseases needed strong remedies. John cared for the people. John cared for the crowds that were around him. But most importantly, most importantly, John cared for the truth. And John wanted the people to hear the truth. John wanted the people to see that there is a necessity of repentance. And that's what the people needed to hear. They needed to see the seriousness, the seriousness of their sin, the greatness of their sin. And that's something for all that would preach the Word of God, that we must be grounded there first and foremost. 
One aspect of preaching that can lead to great idolatry is the fact that you are in front of people and you have many people's attention. And there's many ways in which you can get people's attention and there's ways in which you can captivate an audience. But that which is in the Word of God is that which is in the Word of God. And the one who stands behind the pulpit, the one who opens the Word of God, is to preach that which is contained within the Word of God regardless of the consequences. John the Baptist is going to face great consequences because of his ministry. He is going to lose his life. The king is going to take his head because of the ministry that he does. His words will get him in great, great trouble. But his purpose, his goal was not to raise his level with the king, was not to be in a higher standing with the culture. His desire was to preach the word of God. And his desire was to be a blessing to the people, to point the people to the reality of their sin. You brood of vipers. He's, he's calling them snakes. He's basically comparing them to, let, let's say there was, a, there was a field and it caught on fire. And one of the things that we're, we don't live, you know, we don't live in the country, so we don't understand all of these illustrations, but the idea that there is a field and it is caught on fire. There's a great grass fire, kind of like now, where there's not a lot of rain going on. And it quickly ignites. And you see the snakes as the fire is beginning to go through the field. They are fleeing outward from the crops into the open area, trying to get away from the, the flames. That's what he's comparing them to. Like this people that has a, a, a sense of sin, a, a sense of the, there, there's something wrong. We must understand godly repentance. Though godly repentance isn't merely recognizing that something that you've done is wrong. It's not merely recognizing that there's consequences to your sin recognizing that you have offended a righteous and a holy God. That even calling someone a snake in that situation is but to say higher than what they are. For we as a people who sin before God are even lower than that. And John is preaching this to them. John is speaking this truth to them. John is desiring for them to see this first and foremost John desires for them to see the bad news. How many times have we said, you have got to hear the good news, you've got to hear the bad news before you can hear the good news? What good is the good news if there is no bad news? If you don't understand that which Jesus would save you from, what purpose is Jesus for you? Is Jesus merely here so you can pray to him and he can help you to get a different job? Is he here so you can pray to him and he can help you to get a different car or he can help you to be in a different relationship or he can help you with your marriage? There's a great many things that Jesus can do to help you with. But what good are any of these if you die in your sin, if you never see the seriousness of your sin, if you never see the depth of your sin, you never see the greatness of your sin. I mean, friends, what good is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? What good is it if you, you climb the company ladder and you get that next thing you want? I just want this job, or I just want this house, or I just want this car. These are all great things that you can have. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for any of those or to desire any of those. But none of those even begin to deal with our real issue. And the purpose for which Christ came was to save people from their sins. And the houses and the cars and the jobs will not go with us. But your relationship with Christ will continue if, in fact, you have one. Or your lack of relationship with Christ, your friends, will continue if you have not one. Those things will be set in place. There is no changing that at the moment of death. There is but a time now when a people can see their sin and turn to Christ. And there is but a time when they are dead and to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. The God has given a time for man to die and then the judgment, and that is it. There's, there's no more at that point. And the list of things that people will cling to 
to make themselves feel that they are right with God. There's a people here. There's a people here that believes that they are right with God because they come out of the right heritage. They're coming out of the right ethnic group. God has blessed Jews previously. I am a Jew, therefore, God is smiling upon me. John, John knows where their heart is. John says this in verse, chapter, verse 8. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Don't tell yourself that I'm in a good standing with God because of who my parents were. Don't tell yourself, I'm in a good standing with God because my grandfather was a pastor. Don't tell yourself, I'm in a good standing with God because I've always gone to church. He is preaching a message of repentance. He is preaching the necessity of repentance. This is something that Jesus taught. This isn't just a John the Baptist thing. This is something that you see taught in the Old Testament by Old Testament prophets. You see it taught now by John the Baptist who basically leaps out of the Old Testament and on to the New Testament. You see this preached by Jesus. You see this preached by the apostles. Luke 13 and verse 3, we'll see this as we keep going. Jesus says, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. John was not interested in bringing people to the waters and baptizing them so he could have bigger and bigger numbers. He wasn't trying to compete with the next prophet down the street to see who could get more people baptized. He wasn't interested in having a great following that is evident in how he even began this sermon. He is interested in this. He is interested in baptizing those who know their sin and desire to turn from it toward God. That's his desire. You can't trust in those that came before you. You can't trust in your pedigree. You can't trust in the righteousness of other people that you came from or the righteousness of the people that are around you. There's but one place, dear friend, you can find righteousness, and that is in Jesus Christ. If you find not your righteousness in Jesus Christ, you find not righteousness. You're empty. It is a facade of righteousness. It will burn away in the judgment. You will not stand before the Lord on your own goodness. It doesn't matter how many wicked people you see in the world. It doesn't matter how good you feel when you watch other people do foolish things. Your righteousness must come from Jesus Christ. I want to make a little comment here as well. That I think it would do well for our Reformed brothers and sisters who are not Baptists to recognize that when I asked the question, who did John the Baptist baptize? He was not asking them to bring their babies to get baptized in the waters. It is not the babies who are then asking him, what should we do? John the Baptist is here baptizing people who know their sin and see their sin and are repenting of their sin. Infants were excluded by this. Who did he baptize? Only those who were repentant. Only those who saw their sin and recognized the need to turn from it. Philip Ryken makes this point. He says, we are not saved by who we are, but by who God is, and by, by what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. You are saved if you are in fact saved, because you have seen the seriousness of your sin. You have seen the depth of your sin. You have seen the totality of your sin. It has affected you in every way. It has affected your desires it has affected your thoughts. It has affected your actions. There is irreparable harm spiritually upon you because of your sinfulness. And there is absolutely nothing that you can do in and of yourself to fix that. It doesn't matter how many Hail Marys you pray. It doesn't matter how many times that you go to church. It doesn't matter how many good deeds that you do. 
They will in no way change your standing with God. Understand this. Your desire, your desire to do certain things to make yourself right before God, your desire to do certain good works to raise your standing with God is even more sinful than if you hadn't done that. Is that shocking? The Bible compares the deeds that you do that you believe are righteous that are going to raise your standing with God as filthy rags. It's bad enough that you're trying to bribe the king of the universe. You're trying to bribe the king of the universe with that which is defiled, with that which should be thrown in the trash, that which should be burned. Nothing in my hands do I bring. Only to the cross do I cling. Can you say that, dear friends? Nothing in my hands do I bring, but only to the cross do I cling. Do you have your hands full? Do you have your hands full of your self-righteousness? You have your hands full of all that you have done to make yourself right. You have your hands full of the world, the flesh, and the devil. What are you holding? How can you cling to the cross, dear friends, when your hands are full of the wor- this world, when you're trusting in the things of this world? How can you cling to the righteousness of Jesus when your hands are full of your self-righteousness as you're clinging to these filthy rags that you desire to bring before the throne of God and throw down to justify yourself? Look at, look at what I have done. If you could use your righteousness... Jesus didn't need to come. If you could have done sufficient good deeds, if you could have suffered enough, if you could have prayed enough, if you could have gone to church enough to make yourself right before God, Jesus never needed to come in the flesh. It wasn't necessary. He could have given you the list, say this many prayers, do this many good deeds, make sure you do this. It doesn't exist. And furthermore, you have the law of God before you that you violate, that you do not keep. We aren't saved by those to whom we are related. We're not saved by our deeds. We are saved by God. And understand this, dear Christian, because we can all struggle with our faith at times. But you, dear friends, are not even saved by the greatness of your faith. The strength of your faith, it is the greatness of the object of your faith through which you are saved. You struggle in your faith, you cling tighter to Christ. You struggle with difficulty, you cling tighter to Christ. All the more reason to remember why I need Jesus. All the more reason to remember why I am not sufficient and Jesus is sufficient. And he gives the warning. He gives a very serious and stark warning. A serious and stark warning that the people here need to hear and all people everywhere need to hear. And that is the reality of the judgment of God. That God is going to make all things right in the end. A lot of times people say, I I can't believe in God because of all of the evil in the world. Why doesn't God just get rid of all the evil in the world? He could do that. He's powerful enough to do that. But the person saying that doesn't realize that the Lord would have to remove them. He's basically saying, God, why don't you just annihilate me and make the world better? No, that's not what he says. You're thinking of all these other people out there. The Lord has granted the world to continue to exist. The Lord has given that opportunity that people may turn to Jesus Christ, that they may trust in him, but he's going to make all things new. He's going to make right all that was made wrong in the garden. Here's John's warning. He says, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
This is talking about the judgment of God. That, that is the eternal expectation of all who are not in Christ Jesus. As, as we saw at the end of John 3, and it says, all, the wrath of God is over all who are not believing upon the Son. That is your reality right now, dear friends. If you're not in Christ Jesus, if you have not seen the seriousness of your sin and turned from it, if you have not seen the ways in which you have sinned against God and greatly displeased Him, the wrath of God is over you. You must see this. You must understand this while there is still time. There are a great many that will shy away from this topic. I think there are some that you can be bringing it in when it's not even necessarily there. But when you have a passage like this, it is very clearly here. It is very clearly talking about divine judgment. It's very clearly talking about the wrath of God falling upon the sinners. And there's some that will say, there's some that will preach, and they'll say, you know, I, I don't like to talk about the wrath of God. I, I don't like to talk about hell. You know, I, I just want to talk about the words of Jesus. I just want to preach about what Jesus talked about. A man that says that hasn't read many of the words of Jesus. And if he has read them, he hasn't paid attention to what Jesus says. He's reading the words of Jesus through a lens because let me tell you this, if you were to take all of the words of Jesus out of the Bible, they don't sound bite beyond that, but if you were to take all the words of Jesus out of the Bible, you would have very little information about hell. Jesus talked about hell more than every other person in the Bible combined. Nobody talked about hell as much as Jesus talked about hell. J.C. Ryle makes this point. It's a long quote, but J.C. Ryle was fantastic on this, this, this third chapter of Luke. I want to say that. But Ryle says this. He says, The subject of hell is always offensive to human nature. The minister who dwells much upon it must expect to find himself regarded as coarse, violent, unfeeling, and narrow-minded. Men love to hear smooth things and to be told of peace and not of danger. But the subject is one that ought not to be kept back. If we desire to do good to souls, it is the one that the Lord our, it is the one that our Lord Jesus Christ brought forward frequently in his public teachings. That loving Savior who spoke so graciously of the way to heaven has also used the plainest language about the way to hell. Dear friends, help you if you believe that you are more righteous than Jesus. Help you, dear friends, if you believe that you are holier than Jesus. Help you if you believe that you know how better to preach than Jesus. Ryle continues, he says, the religion in which there is no mention of hell is not the religion of John the Baptist and of our Lord Jesus and his apostles. John is preaching of the reality of of judgment. He's preaching on the reality of the judgment of God that will fall upon all people who are unrepentant. All people who die in their sins. You have many in this passage that are going to ask, well, what should we do? You're going to see the crowd as a whole ask. You're going to see soldiers ask. You're going to see, um, you're going to see tax collectors ask. But you're not going to see Pharisees or Sadducees ask John what they should do. See, those are a group of people that are standing on their credentials. They're standing on their lineage. They're standing on their position. The Pharisees see themselves as the theologians of the day, those that are leading the common man, those that are the most righteous that are there. The Sadducees are the ones that are running things. They are running the temple. They are profiting greatly off of the temple. They are the pragmatics of this day. And neither of these people at this point are seeing the seriousness of, of their sin. There is a saving repentance that must be there. So when I talk about repentance and its connection to salvation, 
Faith and repentance are so instrictly tied together, you cannot have one without the other. You will have faith and repentance. They will both be there. And repentance, saving repentance, okay, this, this metanoia that, that we're seeing in, in numerous places, in salvation is you seeing the seriousness of your sin. You're having a change of mindset. Instead of continuing to walk down this pathway, you are turning. You're turning from a mindset which is telling you, I can justify myself before the Lord. I can do so many good religious deeds to make myself right. And you're turning from that. You're recognizing there is no hope down this pathway. I'm about to walk down a cliff. I'm about to walk into the flames. And you're turning this direction towards Jesus. And so it is that change of mindset that we're looking at theologically there in saving repentance. Secondly, too, that you have sanctifying repentance. That's not the end of it. There is the Lord actually removing particular sins from your life. And that is the Lord sanctifying you and the Lord changing you. And that is what the Lord will do for his people. Sanctifying repentance is something that I think we see here in the next point, and that's where we have the fruit of repentance. We saw the necessity of repentance, the requirement of repentance, that that apart from actual repentance, you will die in your sins. There is no hope for you. You are like those that John talks about in this passage that are being thrown into the fire. Secondly, we see the fruit of repentance. Repentance. The work of the Holy Spirit inside of someone and and sanctifying them and changing them. Let's look at these next few verses, verse 10 through 14 in Luke 3. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. John here is leading them in rightly understanding the law of God. There's there's different groups that are asking him, What shall we do? How shall we respond? The Lord has begun to work upon some of these people. Some of these may not be true converts, Quite possibly, if we just do the math on it, and the fact that you're going to have a very large crowd that is declaring that Jesus needs to be crucified. But from what we can see here, and all we can do is look at what's actually happening. I can't see into your heart. All I can do is go by your words and and your actions. And they're asking, what do we do? There's some work that's happening here. The the preaching of John is is affecting these people. They are recognizing that they are on a pathway that is wrong, and they need to change. And John begins by applying the Eighth Commandment in each of their contexts. He applies it to the crowd, just kind of generally. He applies it to the soldiers, and he applies it to the tax collectors. How is it that the Eighth Commandment should be applied in your particular station in life. And remember this, that the the law of God, when we walk through the Ten Commandments, there is a positive aspect and a negative aspect to each and every one of these commandments. Okay, so if I'm not to steal, do not steal, that's already a negative commandment, right? Don't take other people's things. But there is a positive corresponding side to this. There's not a neutral position. If anything, the Sermon on the Mount should have taught us that. There's, there's not a neutral position. And much of Paul's writings encourage people in this to put this off and to put this on. He doesn't just say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then it's just going to be, okay, I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lust. No, you're putting this off and then you're putting something on. There's something positive that you're going to be doing in response to what you're not doing. Your religion is not just one of negativity. There is a positive side to this. So the eighth commandment is do not steal, which means you don't take something that belongs to someone else. You don't take the property of someone else that you, you, you don't have permission to, to take. But it also means that you are to work diligently with your hands. You are to go and be a laborer and you are to work and you are to be profitable so that you can cover your needs in particular 
and so that you will have something to share with others. Now, how this may work in each and every person's life may not be exactly the same, but this is the general idea. And just so you don't think that I'm just pulling this out of thin air, Paul applies it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, and we've taught of this before, so I'm not going to unpack this idea of positive and negative laws in the Ten Commandments, but it's something we've taught on very extensively previously. But Ephesians 4 and verse 28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need. Okay, that, that, that's the idea that we have here, that, that you are to work and you are to labor, so you're to be diligent, and then you can give to someone else. This is very consistent with what Jesus says in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 42. He says, or there 43, he says, I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also, then they also will answer, Lord, when did we not see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? So this is what he's instructing the crowds. He's telling them, whoever has two tunics is to share with one who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. And how were they to do this? How was this to come about? This, he's not saying this is just something that's, that's haphazard. This is something that's going to have to be intentional with your life. They were to work with their hands with such diligence that they would be profitable, that, that they would make something profitably with their hands, that they would be able to cover their needs that they had, and they would manage what they had profited with diligence so that it wasn't squandered, so that it wasn't wasted. So when they got to the end of the month and they did their bills, they would have the ability to give to someone else. I mean, that's the only way a family is going to be able to do that. The only way that you're going to be able to be a giving person is that you're going to have to be profitable with your hands, and then you're going to have to manage what the Lord has given to you. Now, again, how this works out in each and every person's life, it can be, can be slightly different. But this is a general principle that we have here, and this is the principle that he's giving to the people here, that you need to be diligent with the resources the Lord is giving to you. You need to be mindful of where you're sitting and what the Lord would have you to do. How can you use what the Lord has given to you with an eternal purpose, with an eternal significance? Labor in a way that is righteous before the Lord and know that. That, that there's no jobs before the Lord that, that are small. The Lord has you where you are for a particular purpose at a particular time. The question you have to ask yourself is not, how do I have myself in a place where the Lord doesn't have me? You need to ask yourself, how can I glorify the Lord where I am? How can I bless the Lord where I am? How would the Lord have me to bless others in the station and the place where I am? Tax collectors, they ask him the question. They say, teacher, what shall we do? And he says to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Now, tax collectors were a group of people that were just about the most despised in the culture. Um, most of them were Jewish people who were hired by the Romans to take taxes. And so they are taking, they are Jews that are taking taxes from the Jews to give to the pagan Romans. That's the first reason. The other reason is that they would steal. They had power, they had authority, they had soldiers that were with them, and they would use that to extort money from other people, to take money from other people. Um, in the Meshnah, that's the uh, written Jewish oral tradition. Also in the Talmud, it's rabbinic teaching and debates on the Torah. They place tax collectors in the same category as murderers and thieves. That's how much they were despised in this culture. Many believe that just a tax collector merely touching your home, made your home, unclean Jews were forbidden. Now, this isn't in the Old Testament. I'm just telling you this is the teachings that existed um, around that time and shortly after. Jews were forbidden from receiving money, including alms from tax collectors, since their re revenues were deemed robbery. John tells them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Stop robbing people. Trust God. Trust God in your life. Trust God with your wages. Be content with what you're given. Don't lust after what the Lord has given someone else. Don't use your power and the authority to go and to steal from other people. 
And there are the soldiers. Soldiers ask him, what shall we do? And he says to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. He's additionally bringing in the ninth commandment there. Don't lie about other people. But being a soldier in the first century was a job that didn't pay very well. Some of these were likely Jews or they were Syrians that were brought in to work for uh, the Roman army, but they could have been actually Roman soldiers who, who, who were Romans. But these soldiers would be used as soldiers, of course. They'd also be used as a police force, and they'd be used also as just basic labor workers. I don't know if you know this, but the roads that the gospel would go down throughout Rome... These roads that would be used by Paul and many other apostles and missionaries to spread the good news of Christ throughout the Roman Empire, they were built primarily by Roman soldiers. And the soldiers would go and take over an area, and then they would go and they would build the infrastructure in that area, and they would build the roads so that they could continue to bring more and more resources into that area. It was a very difficult job. The job didn't pay, to pay well. Your life was on the line. And they were tempted to go and to steal from other people. They had opportunity to exploit. And John's commanding them, do not do that. And you're seeing here what I'm calling the fruits of repentance. All right, this is the point. This is the, this is the result of, uh, of, of repentance in someone's life is that there is going to be a change. It's not just words. So when I talk about saving repentance, I'm not talking about, well, someone just said some words. Someone just repeated a prayer after someone else. There has to be a change within you. There has to be a change of mindset, and that is the saving part of it, but there is the sanctifying part. There is the continued work that happens in that person's life, and the Lord's going to continue that. And we're seeing that, that fruit here as it looks in the lives of these people, as they're asking these questions, what do we need to do? H how should we live differently in light of what you're saying? Philip Ryken says this. He says, true repentance means much more than feeling sorry for what we have done. It means turning away from sin and living in obedience to God. We must remember what godly repentance is. Godly repentance is not being sorry over your situation. Godly repentance isn't merely just being fearful of the consequences because of your actions. Godly repentance sees what you have done rightly before God and recognizes that you must change. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, for godly, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Dear friends, we must not confuse worldly grief over sin with godly repentance. They, they are not the same thing. J.C. Ryle says this. He says, it is vain to say with our lips that we repent if we do not at the same time repent in our lives. It is more than vain. It will gradually sear our consciences and harden our hearts to say that we are sorry for our sins is mere hypocrisy unless we show that we are really sorry for them by giving them up. Doing is the very life of repentance. And he's saying something that's very important. Dear friends, I, I hope you see this. I hope you understand the warning that J.C. Ryle just gave to all who would hear that. That your continued, I'm sorry, I played the fool, I made a mistake, is going to sear your conscience. Think of the life of Saul. A man who never truly saw his sin, merely just saw the consequences of his sin. And he would be caught and he would say, I played the fool. He never saw the depth of his sin, the greatness of his sin. He lived in hypocrisy, going to necromancers and diviners to go and to hear, hear, hear from spirits. And yet he was supposed to be king over Israel. True repentance was not in him. And it becomes easier and easier, and easier, and easier to continue to walk down that pathway of unrepentance. Your conscience will become seared. There are things that previously in your life, they would have caused you to blush. There are things that previously in your life, you would have been ashamed of. 
that you will gather together with others and sing boldly of. You, you will celebrate. You, you will joyfully dance around in that which is contrary to the law of God. That is the road of unrepentantness. That is the road of rebellion against God. And that conscience that is there, that conscience that is, that is there within you is becoming seared every time you walk in rebellion willfully and you try to, okay, I'll do better next time. And you continue to lower the bar and lower the bar and lower the bar. And the reality is you never saw the highness of it. You never saw the ways in which you fell short. You began thinking you were pretty good and you kept lowering this bar and lowering this bar morally. And you never saw the ways in which you fell short of God's standard. You never saw your need of Christ Jesus, the necessity of Christ Jesus. You had not that saving repentance that said, I see my sin. I need to turn to Christ. And you never had the sanctifying repentance because you never had the saving. So there was no fruit of repentance in your life. Nothing more than lip service. Nothing more than, than mere actions as your parents had authority over you. But there was nothing there within your heart. Nothing that really changed you. Nothing that merely affected you. And that work of your parents is just something that is, that is pointing forward. Though not perfectly, but pointing forward to your relationship with God. The truth is, dear friends, it doesn't matter if you're in Jesus or not. You have a relationship with God. It's a matter of what kind of relationship do you have. Are you one in right fellowship with the Lord, or are you one who is at enmity with God? And as your parents, as it says in Hebrews, sought to discipline you rightly and well, it is merely just pointing forward to that true discipline from God, that true judgment that will even fall from God for all who are not in Christ, that is a reminder of the reality of what is there. But we must understand the source of repentance. The source of repentance does not lie in men's smooth words. It doesn't lie in just grunting. It doesn't lie in us pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. It doesn't lie and us just doing better, us just working harder, us just being around the right groups of people. All of these could be good and decent things in and of themselves. But when you try to make that your standard of righteousness, they become evil, they become vile. The source of repentance, we see that in verses 15 through 17. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I, coming the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. It says, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. You must understand culturally here that rabbis would have disciples that would follow them. So Jesus having disciples that went around with him wasn't something that was that was odd for the time period. It was very common for uh, rabbis to have disciples that would follow them and would be instructed. Sometimes they'd even stay in their house, but they would, they would even serve the rabbis. They would do uh, deeds for them. They'd do tasks for them. They would carry his bags or, or, or whatever he needed. You see Jesus even using his disciples in this way. Jesus sends his disciples to do particular tasks, and they're not surprised. It's not like, oh, what do you think you're doing? No, it was... It was, it was normal for a rabbi to give his disciples tasks to do, and they would serve the, uh, the leader, the rabbi. But there were limits to what you could give your servant to do. There were limits to what you could give one of your disciples to do. And one of those tasks that you absolutely could not give to your disciple to do was to remove your sandal and wash your feet and to wash your sandal. Now, this is something that we don't directly relate to in our context because although it is dirty when we walk out the doors, it's not dirty like it was in this time period as you walk through, um, 
as you walk through the streets and as you walk through the wilderness. There, was, there were animals that were going down the same roads that you were going down, so they were very filthy roads, and they were very gross. And so when you came into your, someone's house, or when you came into your own house, you would take off your shoes, you would take off your sandals, and you would immediately wash your feet because you don't want to bring all of that into, into the house. But one of the things that you could not make your disciple do was to remove your sandals or wash it and to wash your feet. So understand it in that context. Okay, only a slave or a servant could be, could be made to remove the master's sandal. John is saying this, one is coming that I am not even worthy to be his slave. I'm not worthy to be his servant. He's saying, I am not worthy to be a slave in the house of Jesus. And just for a minute, just for a minute, how can you hear that and not think about what Jesus did with his disciples? Understanding that cultural context and understanding it is Jesus that got down and washed the feet of his disciples. Something the disciples would have refused to do for him. I know, I know one of them did offer to do it, but something they would have refused to do under normal circumstances because it was beneath them, not something they could be required to do. That's what he did for them. The Lord, dear friends, is the source of repentance. John makes that clear. The source of repentance is not within the person, but within the God who grants repentance. John is baptizing with water. John is doing an, an outward action that is to be demonstrating something that's happening inwardly. We all understand that. We're good Baptists in this church. Um, but he, his baptism doesn't actually change anything in the person. This would be a good argument against those that would hold to baptismal regeneration and say, well, when you get baptized, that's when the Holy Spirit begins to indwell within you, and that's when you, you, know, you become justified before God. There's a lot of problems with that view, namely that it's works-based righteousness. But John here is talking about this baptism he's doing, and this baptism is demonstrating something that is happening outwardly. Then he says he'll baptize in the Holy Spirit with fire. That's talking about what the Lord will do. The Lord will baptize in the Holy Spirit and with fire. I spent some time on that this week. What's he talking about there? In my early years of college, I had, I had visited a charismatic speaker, and his name was Steve Hill. And I was in a, a college group Bible study, and there were charismatics in this group, and I had become to kind of associate with them a little bit, not, not in their religion, but just out of curiosity. And they invited me to go and see this speaker named Steve Hill. Now, Steve Hill is deceased at this point. Um, and he's, he, Steve Hill is one that I, I don't agree with a whole lot of what he said or did. But I was at this, I was at this time, and he finished his, 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 his sermon, and then he did this altar call, and then like 95% of the people went to the front. All of the people I came with went to the front, and I was trying to figure out what is... I'm still sitting in my seat, and all my friends went to the front, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. They're, I, and I, I was telling myself, I was like, okay, I know that person is a Christian. I, I'm certain this. I'm trying to question myself. And finally, I'm hearing all this noise and hooting and hollering going on in the front of the room. And I just think, well, I, I guess I should go up there and see what's going on. Everyone else is crammed in the front of the auditorium at this point. And Steve Hill has everyone lined up. There's a line here and a line here. He's going down the middle. And he is just yelling, fire, 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 fire. And he is as he is doing that, they're falling down and, and going over. And I, I had a friend of mine that was there that actually uh, raised, excuse me, I have a, a, a particular prayer request. So he shared it. Hey, my mother's sick and I want, I, you know, I need a job. And so he, he goes and he stops, he says his prayer. He goes in this guy, fire, fire, fire. And he's, he's knocking the people down. And this is a passage that was used for that, baptizing you in fire. There's this idea amongst charismatics, and they believe that there is a, there's a second blessing that, okay, sure, all Christians have the Holy Spirit, but, but some of y'all are laughing because y'all 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 have been around this before, um, but, but there's the second blessing that you get, okay, and the second blessing comes, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire, and you'll fall out, and you'll speak in tongues, and that's not at all what's happening here. Um, that's not at all what's, what's going on here. Um, you know, it's, 
something when you think about fire biblically, it's not always a positive thing if you think about it. I mean, I understand if you listen to some modern worship songs, if, if you're at youth camp, like being on fire is a really good thing. You want the Lord to set the nation on fire and set this generation on fire and bring us the fire. And, but if you read about that scripturally, that's not necessarily a pleasant thing, especially when you look at this passage here where um, you, you have it equated with judgment two different places here. The axe is put to the base of the tree and all who don't produce fruit in keeping with repentance will be thrown into the fire. And then at the end, his winnowing fork is in his hand to, to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So those are neither one of those sound to be very positive toward the person that is experiencing them. So both of those show the fire of the Lord that's resulting in judgment on those that are unrepentant. All right? And so as I pondered this, I, I ended up looking back at Malachi chapter 3. And I think that's our answer. I think that tells us what it means to be baptized with fire or to be affected by fire. I believe this is a sanctifying effect. It's the sanctifying effect of the work of God in someone's life is the fire that John the Baptist is talking about here. Because he's telling the people there that he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so my first thought was, let me, let me separate these. So the fire is for those that are under judgment, and the Holy Spirit's for those that are in Christ. But he's connecting the two of them. So let's look at Malachi 3. I'll read it to you, beginning in verse 1. He says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Talking about John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. And so that's what John the Baptist is talking about here. He's talking about the sanctifying work that the Lord is going to have. And so there is two aspects to this in our understanding of, uh, of what the Lord is doing. The Lord is doing what he promised he would do in the garden. He is crushing the head of the serpent. He is removing the consequences of sins. And there's one of two ways that is going to happen. Okay, that is going to happen by those who die in their sins, falling into the judgment of God, being placed in hell for all of eternity. That's one way that the Lord is going to deal with sin. The other way that he is going to deal with sin is within the lives of his people, and he is first going to save them. They're going to be justified in Christ Jesus. They're going to be saved by grace and through faith by trusting in Christ Jesus, and the Spirit is going to continue to work within them. And the Lord is going to change them. The Lord is going to refine them. The Lord is going to conform them to the image of Christ Jesus. The Lord is going to work in his people. That's the refiner's fire that we have here. That, that is the fire of the Lord coming down upon the person and changing that person. And, and, and one person mentioned this, one commentary mentioned this, and I thought it was a fantastic example. Because John is in the priestly line. John's in the priestly line here. And one of the things that the priests would do in the temple would be to wash the utensils. They would go and they would clean them during the times of the temple ministry. And we have him here doing that, the, the commentator argued, for the people of God in this baptism that he is doing because he is pointing them to Christ Jesus, the means through which they can be saved, the means through which they can be cleaned. And so these instruments of God which, dear friends, I pray that you desire to be, is to be an instrument in the hand of God. He is refining his people. He is cleansing his people. But as we saw at the beginning, there is a necessity of repentance. There is a requirement of repentance. There is a requirement that you see your sin and your insufficiency, that you see your inability through your actions to save yourself. But the Lord works in his people, and he goes and he changes them, and he brings about fruits of righteousness within them. Because that's the reality, dear friends. You're born into this world dead. You're spiritually born, stillborn. You're, you're unable 
You're unable to walk in righteousness. All that you do is sin. It's not as simple as it can be. But you do not meet that standard in your action. But The Lord Jesus Christ works within his people to give them a new heart, to give them a new mind, to give them ears to hear and eyes to see. And the Lord works in his people that they would walk in obedience. And that's the change that happens, that you can walk in righteousness. You have that ability, dear Christian, in Christ Jesus, to walk in obedience. And the source of that, the source of that comes through the work of God. Through the work of the Spirit of God. Through the work of the Word of God. Through the work of the preaching of the God and the reading of the God and the singing of the Word of God. Through all of these means, the Lord is working within His people. And the Lord is the source of this repentance apart from which we would all be without hope. Our dear friends, I pray that you hear this. I pray that you hear the urgency in such a message. I pray that you would be like the people that even say, what what, what shall we do? Turn to Jesus Christ. Cling to the cross. Trust in Christ alone. Not in your own works. Not in your own culture. Not in your own pedigree. But in Christ Jesus. And he will make you new. And he will give you.